Dr. Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline, live at ASEP 16, recording um, here in the exhibition hall. So you're going to get some good natural sound for our ASEP podcast. And it's, uh, if you don't know by now, we are, um, we are on a weekly basis. So subscribe to the ASEP Frontline podcast every single week. We're going to have at least 52 a year, maybe some more, depending on what we can get ourselves into, but hopefully bringing you the best and brightest from around um, from around the country and actually around the world with uh, just wrapped up a series from uh, Smack in Dublin. Hopefully going to be back there in the, in, in Germany uh, in uh, this next year in the end of June. Um, but uh, right now at ASEP 16, we got some really great folks. And today, somebody that I've known for a number of years in my neighboring state, actually the state of which I uh, went into uh, went med school, medical school and grew up for 20 years. Um, so really uh, almost a homecoming kind of thing. Dr. Sandy Herman at the, with the uh, careers section. Um, I guess it's Dr. Sanford Herman, but it's, it's Sandy Herman as, ever since I've known it. Sandy is good. All right. So give us a little background, um, where, you're, where you're from, where you practice, um, and how you got interested in the careers section of ASAP. Well, I'm originally from uh, Michigan, went to medical school uh, and uh, graduate school, combined uh, uh, academic programs in Michigan. And I've been in Tennessee since 2002, uh, practiced in a uh, 76,000 visit uh, community-based uh, mm-hmm. hospital uh, where we were quite busy. In a few years, uh, we went from 45,000 patients uh, when we started uh, providing services at Gateway Hospital in Clarksville, Tennessee. And within a few years, we were up to 70,000. So we were continually changing uh, models and trying to deal with the stress that came with a very rapid, over five-year, uh, almost uh, doubling in patient volume. And one thing we've seen, you, 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 you focus on the careers section, and what I've noticed with people is we spend uh, half of our life working as hard as we can to get into medicine, and it seems like once you're in it, there's a lot of conversation of figuring out how you're going to get out of it or what's next. Well, it, it, it's really interesting in, in talking to the new residents that are, that are coming out. The, uh, when section started uh, in the college, uh, the career section started really to uh, recognize and reward uh, longevity uh, in our uh, practicing physicians. And then we began to notice that the, uh, it really wasn't longevity anymore. It was how to survive over the years and how to avoid uh, listening to uh, people come out. And almost the first thing they said after their first year of work is, how to plan their exit right? and what they're exiting to. So what are these stresses that have, that have caused this really change uh, in, in attitude? We'll give some awards to some people uh, that have been in practice for 40 years at the same hospital. And I don't think we're going to continue to see that. And we see more and more physicians now uh, wanting to almost be permanent uh, locums. And I, we, at my hospital, I work for a, a hospital, Baptist Health in Lexington, and I can mention it because it's going to be a huge compliment to that, uh, to that facility. We, we have physicians, several physicians that have been there since the inception of the group 30, 35 years ago. And during that time, we basically only had one or two physicians in 30 years that have actually ever left the group because it is. I mean, so I think there's a huge... I think there's a, a gap in practice now. If you can find that nugget, if you can find that hospital or that system or that setup that is conducive to the physician, I think you still have that opportunity for a very long, happy career somewhere else. But what are the challenges if you're not, if you don't find that nugget, if you don't strike gold, what, what are the challenges we're facing that are causing our uh, burnout in that potential transition in emergency medicine? Well, I, I was reading some articles uh, uh, just this morning uh, listing emergency medicine as uh, either number one or number two specialty on burnout and uh, trying to look at a distribution of when uh, emergency physicians leave the practice and the various stressors. Our volumes have gone up. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're under the scrutiny of... Uh, metrics and benchmarking, sometimes not controlled by our groups. Uh, The um, acuity of patients appears to be higher, and the amount of time spent in front of the computer, uh, as opposed to sitting at the bedside 
and dealing with the with the patient. And you know, we we find that uh, uh, there are a lot of alternatives in medicine, but it, you know, it takes several years to develop the proficiency and skills uh, to provide good emergency care, and then we're we have a drain of our people leaving the specialty. And actually, if you're here in the uh, in the exhibition hall, I'll be talking about burnout today at 3:30 as part of a, a lecture and getting into those numbers that you talked about. And it does seem the front line of medicine, whether that is trauma care, emergency medicine, even urgent treatment, it does have the highest burnout. What are the characteristics of frontline medicine or acute care medicine that makes it such a drain on our on our longevity? Well, I, I think you're talking about the uh, the lack of predictability mm -hmm. of our practice and what comes what comes through the door. You can be sitting at your desk in the emergency department uh, with not very many patients, and with within a few minutes the department can be uh, filled and can be uh, chaotic. Um, rapid decision making, difficulty in transfers. Uh, having a hard time with our backup specialty mm -hmm. care, a shrinking uh, call list, and not as much of a uh, family feeling, that nugget that you described right, in the emergency department, and a lot of uh, transient uh, people coming in and out of the department, and not having somebody work for that 10 years, uh, and developing a career with the same nurses, uh, the same providers surrounding you. And those are just a few of the stresses. And some people went into medicine really without the intention of practicing. Uh, they may have wanted to go into the business side of it. And uh, other people were looking for alternative careers outside of the emergency department and toxicology and so many different avenues that you can now go into. You, you mentioned the turnover, that family feeling in the emergency department, it seems like now that hospitals, emergency departments get excited when their nurse turnover drops to 10% in a year or 20% in a year. So we're talking every five to 10 years completely replacing a staff, starting with new people. How much do you think that loss, you know, what I hear there, a lot of what I hear is a loss of control over our environment, that feeling of our workplace, of being able to walk in and knowing, you know, we're being told what we need to do in terms of care we provide. We're being told what we, how we have to document, even if it's not the most efficient method of, of documentation. Um, wh where does that loss of, of control from the physician standpoint in our workplace play into it? When I first started in practice, uh, we had the same group of physicians and we had the same group of nurses for years. Mm -hmm. And the turnover in the nursing staff was actually very small. And, you know, I keep on going back to that family attitude right. uh, of the department. And so we've lost that. If you look around now, we're scrambling for traveling nurses. Mm -hmm. We're scrambling for traveling docs. Uh, the stresses of getting the patient through, the stress of boarding, and another thing that I think uh, I've seen, and w one of the one area that I've seen the most amount of uh, complaints or concern, is how we're dealing with the uh, surge of behavioral health patients and boarding of behavioral health, and taking up uh, uh, time and space in the emergency department where we're trying to initiate care or get them transferred to the the best facility. I think that's a big stressor. Oh, absolutely. So what's next? So you guys have clearly have considered that transition. What are some options for the physicians out there that are thinking, I don't see myself at four in the morning on Christmas Eve when it's a Saturday night in the emergency department anymore? What, what do we see in terms of that transition? How do we do that? And what are things that, that are good opportunities for us? Well, I was looking at two things uh, in the last uh, several days. One was changes within clinical practice, mm -hmm. and the other was finding uh, areas of work that are non-clinical. So we used to have the, uh, the standards or the, uh, the standard transition to urgent care, to 
occupational uh, health um, to uh, uh, insurance, uh, you know, work. Uh, then you have the, the non-clinical. Uh, there can be doing chart reviews for uh, uh, medical legal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, there can be going actually into uh, business and, and evaluating and setting the benchmarks. Uh, you can go into the insurance industry. So there, there are both clinical and non-clinical options for change. Also, that there's kind of a trimodal distribution of when people leave practice. Okay. Uh, you know, the first group might be that, that group of physicians uh, that had uh, combined training in medical school with either uh, business or legal aspects, and they wanted to change rather quickly and mm -hmm. not stay in clinical practice. And then, then there was that second group at the 40 to 45-year-old age group that uh, wanted to transition into a, uh, another business model, uh, either in freestanding emergency departments, again, into urgent care. And then the third group was a true burnout group, that in the uh, physician in his uh, 50s, that it just it doesn't enjoy it anymore and has not adapted well to the, uh, the changes our environment in the emergency department. Computers, uh, the electronic mm -hmm. health records, and the constant push to get patients out of the emergency department to the floor when there's no beds. You know, when the volume, the volume jump up. Man, I found that in, in the departments I've worked in, anytime there was a significant, well, either a change in EHR or transition to EHR or change in EHR or a significant increase in volume, our state in Kentucky with the Affordable Care Act within... Uh, 24 months, we were up 30% volume uh, from the years before. And it, it, interestingly, it wasn't low acuity. It was across the board. The, the, the low acuity, the mid acuity, the high acuity, the critical care, all of it increased over that time frame. And I found that anytime one of those takes place, there's a significant stress on the staff that's in that emergency department. And I think there's a great deal of... Um, burnout that you get from that. I mean, I think as much as we love emergency medicine, because it is variety, we still like a lot of consistency in our lives, in our workplace, in, in, in what we see. And I think we have a difficult time when we have those significant transitions. Am I off base or is, or is, is that a pretty consistent thing outside of the, the hospitals I've worked? No, I, I, don't think you're, I don't think you're off base at all. So we've seen the volumes go up. Uh, we've seen acuity. Mm -hmm. We've seen, in some cases, less physician coverage. And, you know, the workforce issue, I also think, is uh, uh, significant. We've been struggling with a, a workforce issue since I've been in emergency medicine. In, in the state of Tennessee, we have 143 emergency departments, and we only have about 800 to 850 practicing emergency physicians to try to staff 140 plus emergency mm -hmm. departments. So we're constantly working on trying to get a stable staff, both uh, nurses and physicians. Uh, we seem to be relying very heavily on uh, allied health professionals, our physician assistants and uh, advanced nurse practitioners. So the whole model has changed. Uh, this doesn't look anything uh, when I like when I entered practice 31 years ago. So if you're out there right now and you're feeling the burn, the seat's hot, you got a little beads of sweat going down when it comes to your burnout for emergency medicine, what are some things that people can do? I mean, it seems like the section here probably has um, resources or opportunities to connect and to get with folks to to make that next transition or to talk to folks about it. What are the options out there to where you don't feel like you're alone on an island? Well, we have the careers section. And as I said initially when we started our discussion, we gave awards for longevity, for tenure in the, in the same uh, institution. Uh, this year we're giving some awards to physicians that have been in the same location same emergency mm -hmm. department for 41 years. We have two physicians that have been there for 41 years. But 
a few years ago, we only had about 110 people in the section. Now we have 570 uh, emergency physicians in the career section. And instead of just looking at uh, awards for longevity, awards for tenure, awards for hanging out, we now have a lot of physicians who have just entered practice in the career section. And our emphasis is shifting. It's shifting as what kind of support and what kind of advice can we give you for alternatives. So at this year's section meeting, we're going to discuss transition into freestanding emergency departments. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about pediatric emergency medicine. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, something new that's coming down the pike, and that's fit to serve evaluations. There was a, uh, a resolution on the council floor uh, concerning the aged physician and what kind of health and are you still a safe provider? So we're going to discuss those kind of things. You know, and I think it's very important to ask yourself, how do you feel at the end of a shift? How do you feel at the end of an eight hour shift, a nine or a 12 hour shift, which really puts a strain. And as acuity has gone up, you walk out of those shifts really evaluating how your day went. We have to balance the work. I know when I first started, seeing three or four patients an hour was not very difficult. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of our trained physicians, emergency physicians, are struggling between 1.4 and 1.8 physicians, patients per hour. So how do you feel at the end of the day? I've always been one that's, that's been a big fan of the 9 and 10. I understand, especially when folks come out, they want the lifestyle outside of the emergency room, so they'd rather do fewer 12-hour shifts. But it does. It burns that whole day. You feel more worn out. The rest of that day, you don't get to spend the uh, time with the kids. I mean, I've, I do 9-hour shifts now, and I feel like that I have at least a little bit of every one of those days even when I'm in a run of shifts, that I get to spend with my kids, that I get to spend with my wife, um, that, that we actually get to live a little bit of life. And so it's looking at those things in your area that can promote wellness, that can promote, um, promote satisfaction in the job. What are some good key thoughts that the folks that are sitting out there right now in their emergency department, things you can do locally possibly to... Uh, to cool the burn a little bit. Well, I, I think that there's some things that are groups or individual groups of whether you're in a small democratic group or a multi-hospital system group or a uh, managed uh, uh, provider group uh, that we can do. I have I've never personally uh, been in favor of a shift longer than eight or nine hours mm -hmm. maximum. But things that the group can do, we can have you can have group activities for your uh, providers. I know that when I first started working, one of the benefits of the group was uh, uh, membership to a health club and encouraged to go and finding outside avenues or hobbies that uh, can occupy your, uh, occupy your time. It seems like we're always reading articles, we're studying, but we have to remember save time for the family, save time for yourself, and make sure that you take care of yourself uh, the, the emphasis that the college has placed in the last year and then going forward uh, on wellness and taking mm -hmm. care of yourself. A healthy physician base is going to provide better care to our patients. There's two things I hear. I hear turn, I, I hear turn that negativity environment where it's every email you get, every communication you get is, I don't do this, don't do this, or you did this wrong, or whatever support, raise up that positive environment, that those positive things, whether it's with the physicians, whether it's with the nurses, whether it's as a department as a whole, and then also making sure that you take care of yourself. And that has been a huge, with Dr. Jay Kaplan as president this last year, been a huge focus, is that wellness of the physician. Take care of you so you can take care of others, so you can be there. And we've only you know, I've been recording here this morning, and we've already had the second reference to fitness and going to the gym. So uh, clearly, we have things to do in medicine where us as physicians, PAs, nurse practitioners, we need to take care of ourselves, make sure that we're healthy um, psychologically, physically, 
you know, mentally in a good place. There's a lot of good resources out there uh, that, that, that you can get involved with, a lot of good communities. The uh, M Docs, EM Docs on uh, Facebook is a good page um, that's done right out of uh, uh, Tennessee there with you with KK Moody um, and her folks. You know, that's a good place to get in there and share. And knowing that you're not alone on the island, that, that we are all feeling the strains of modern medicine and modern health care, uh, and that, uh, you know, as, as, together, uh, as a team, as, as the family of emergency medicine, I think we can uh, really support, uh, support each other and, and help us as we move forward in this career that will surely and absolutely continue to change as quickly as it has the last uh, decade. Dr. Herman, give us some information. How can folks contact you, get more information uh, about um, the uh, careers section as well as overall physician wellness? Well, you can find my contact uh, information uh, at the um, ASAP uh, directory uh, website. Uh, I'm always available for uh, email. I'll answer all of them. It's uh, shherm at aol.com. And you can contact me at any time. You can always go through the uh, careers uh, section. You can contact the college or Tanya Downing uh, at the ASAP office. Uh, as I said a few years ago, we had 100 members. We're getting close to 600 members in the career section, and the encouraging thing is that we're seeing younger members join the career section and planning for the future and planning for the longevity, success, and their personal health as they go through this journey of emergency medicine. Well, and I think you're going to continue to, to see it grow rapidly. I have a feeling it's going to be one of the fastest uh, growing sections within ASEP for the number, next number of years to come. And as for me, you can contact ASAP Frontline on our website on the um, on Facebook, ASAP Frontline on Facebook at Everyday Med on Twitter. You can also contact me personally if you have any suggestions on the show or uh, questions. That's uh, your Everyday Medicine at gmail.com. Your Everyday Medicine at gmail.com. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.